creation. It's always exciting when it comes. But I've come to a conclusion. When you do it with four kids, relaxation is not part of it. How many of you are with me on that? <clears throat> this morning, though, as, as we returned yesterday, this morning I woke up, got ready, and there's just something on the way here. I just felt this overwhelming sense of joy and peace, and I realized why that is. And I think it comes from what we're going to talk about this morning. And very simply put, I was just excited this morning coming over here. I was just excited because of Jesus. I'm just excited because of Jesus. The world around us is an absolute mess. Oh, but we, we have Jesus. And that's what happens when it comes to the book of Colossians this morning, here on the highway of Route 66. Paul, in his letter to the Colossians, makes a very strong declaration. He looks up to heaven, to the throne, and sees Jesus and the Father, and he says, all I need is you. All I need is you. And that's the theme that he hits upon throughout this letter. But there's a, it's a starting block. It's a starting block for maybe a couple of maybe the most single most important subjects that we will look at and may have already hinted on along this trip on the highway. And there's a roundabout way of getting there, though, this morning, because we're actually going to start by prefacing these things by talking about intimidation. That's right, intimidation. Anybody ever been there? You ever felt like you were intimidated in a moment? Okay, how many of you are willing to admit that there was a time when you tried to intimidate somebody else? It, it happens, it happens, okay? And I mean, it's, it's kind of like, when you think of examples of this, like anybody in here like boxing or UFC fans? Anybody like that stuff? Because what happens, what happens when they want to intimidate each other? Well, they, they, they're just getting each other's face, and it's all in the facial expressions, nose to nose, just right before the match. You know, you always see them just right up in each other's face, and they're just trying to, trying to mind game on that other person. Same thing happens with, like, NFL, NBA, right? They trash talk each other, trying to get into each other's heads to kind of mess with each other and intimidate each other in that way. Or my favorite example, No Limit Texas Hold'em Poker. When you're sitting at that table, and you've got the big stacks of chips in front of you and you've got these guys around you that have these tiny little stacks in front of them because you want to oh yeah you feel strong and let me tell you when you're playing against somebody that has those giant stacks of chips it's intimidating it's intimidating they'll just bet you out of the hand you may have the winning hand but it doesn't matter because you're intimidated by the fact that they can throw more money at the pot but here's the big thing i wonder about what about spiritual intimidation has anybody ever felt like they dealt with that? Because that's more of the subject today. That's more of where we start today and what Paul's addressing. What happens is, is people who build themselves upon spiritual intimidation, what they do is rather than simply opening up the word and discussing the truth of what it says, instead they point their finger at other people and they say, you need this and this and this and that to be a Christian like me. You need this. You need experience. You need the book knowledge. You need the course taking. You need all the knowledge of, of outside sources that you can. You need to go to those conferences. You need to see these Christian movies. You have to have these talents and these gifts and develop them and have the disciplines. That's how you're going to be a good Christian. It's not the truth, is it? See, Paul's writing to this church at Colossae, this small region near Ephesus. And believe it or not, Paul has actually never visited physically this church. But he knows about this group because he's heard from others about this group that's being intimidated. This church is being intimidated by this group of false teachers. And we know Paul was no stranger to this idea. We talked about how he was attacked by people like that when it came to the church in Corinth. And now... As he addresses the church at Colossae, a big part of this is in chapter 2. As he presents to them, I see the ways you're being intimidated. There's four big ones that I'm witnessing, and I want to tell you how to overcome that. And the first intimidation that he sees is people using philosophy and psychology against them. And so Paul says this, Be careful that no one takes you captive through philosophy based on human tradition. 
and not based on Christ. For the entire fullness of God's nature dwells bodily in Christ. See, these people were looking at the church and saying, you're never going to amount to anything. You're never going to amount to anything psychologically. And you, you never will if you don't master the knowledge of these things. You have to master the self-esteem and the self-confidence. And you have to overcome the problems that stem from family dynamics and the DNA that you've been raised in. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe in good counsel. I do believe in counseling. I went to school for that, so obviously it means something to me because I believe that mental health is an important thing. We need to take care of ourselves in that way, and there are good resources to help. But what Paul's saying is, though those might be good resources, that's not what's going to make you complete. Verse 9 is the entire fullness is not in getting counseling or having the knowledge that surpasses everybody else. The fullness is in God's nature, which dwells bodily in Christ. So don't be taken by philosophy and psychology. Also, don't be intimidated by rules and legalism that people want to bring in. 16 and 17 of chapter 2. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these rules are only shadows of the real things. Christ himself. What you've got is people who say, and maybe you had some people like this, oh, well, you're not eating what you should. You're not drinking the right things. You're not wearing the right things. Or here's one of my favorites. Oh my gosh, it's not right. You can't go to church on Saturday night and not go on Sunday morning. How dare you? You are not the Christian you should be because of these things. But see, what Paul's saying is these things don't really have anything to do with true spirituality. None of these really play into or have anything to do with what it means to have a true relationship with Christ. That's like with me, it's, it's like I think about things like this and I go, oh yeah, I could be bad at like wanting to intake more sugar than I can. Or who's with me going and grabbing the bag of chips at 10 p.m. just because oh, I got the munchies. <laughs> But I'm thankful for Colossians. And I'm thankful for the message that Paul gives because it's a great reminder. It's not about, those things are not about the true relationship that I have with Christ. Those things are not going to change my true relationship with Christ. And it's not just about what we eat, but also, mm, big thing today, oh, what we drink. Yes, it's a touchy subject, isn't it? Amongst many people, this becomes a touchy subject. Because so many people are afraid of the abuse of the freedoms, but that's just it. Think about the words there. It's the abuse of the freedoms. That's where we have to draw the line. And despite the issues that many of us may have with different things that we struggle with in our life, Colossians is such a great reminder for us all that whether it's food or drinking or holy days or rules or a legalistic view that comes from people around us thinking that we should be better because we need to do it their way and they point the finger at us, it has no bearing whatsoever on the perfection that is being made within us in Christ. He is what matters. His gift of grace and salvation is what matters. These things are not going to performance you into Jesus. And the third intimidation that he brings up is a mystical and spiritual experience. It sounds kind of kooky, doesn't it? But that's just it. And they were trying to, these false teachers, these people intimidating the church, were trying to spiritualize this. Do not let anyone who delights in the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. How many of us have ever met that person that spiritualizes things that have no business being spiritualized? That's what we're talking about here. There's a certain level, they say, that you need of spiritual awareness. Being told that, that real true spiritual worship is, is actually being done by the angels around the throne, and that's the only possible way that you can do it. So you need to be in tune with the angels of heaven. You need to connect yourself with them. You have to become outside of yourself during worship, and you need to speak in their tongue in order for this to be real. And then, then you can become as holy as they and be one in Christ. And I think at this point, Paul's probably rolling his eyes. 
as he's thinking about this, because he says, no, you don't need some mystical, magical, spiritual awareness experience in order to be in Christ. You can't over-spiritualize the simplicity of the gospel. You don't need that experience. You just need to make the choice to say, I'm going to live as a follower of Jesus. And then discover what that is. Now, the fourth and final intimidation that he brings is asceticism and self-denial. And in verses 20 and 23, he says, You have died with Christ, and he has set you free from spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following rules of the world? Such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch. Such rules are mere human teachings about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they do require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline. But they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. What he's saying is, is you can't just... It's not about the behaviors. You have to change the mind, not just change the behaviors. Yes, the concepts of what they're trying to say can be used in positive ways because... We don't want to overdo things. We don't want to overwhelm things. We don't want to hoard material things for gain or just simply, you know, abuse what we have. We talked about that earlier. Don't abuse the freedoms. Nobody needs to have a new pair of shoes for every single day. Nobody has to have absolutely new clothes for every single occasion. Or how about the people that have four years worth of food prepped in some cellar in their basement? You know, oh, the apocalypse is coming. Yeah, if you know Jesus, you ain't got to save that stuff because you're gone. (laughs) You want to prep the right way, I'll tell you how to prep the right way. I actually have been given stories from my wife about girls she went to high school with that never wore the same thing twice. What? What? I've been wearing some of the same jeans for five years. I've washed them. I mean, we know being fiscally responsible is a very good thing. And we know that releasing things that we don't need anymore to to give to things like the free giveaway, that's a great thing. And we need to do that stuff. But we can't be put in a position where we believe that these things or the process of performing those things is somehow a method of true spirituality and salvation. So we can't be intimidated in these ways. And Paul is telling them, don't be intimidated by these ways. Remember what you were taught about the gospel. Now we tend to be intimidated by certain people within the church because they want us to adhere to a specific set of rules or they want us to adhere to a specific kind of worship or or certain programs or that performance-based idea in order to be holy and spiritual and made complete in Christ. And it's not that everything, as we said, in that concept is a terrible thing because it's good to serve others. It's good to be charitable and to be giving and generous and to grow. (laughs) It's very important to grow in our knowledge and understanding of God's word and who he is in our lives. But Paul is addressing this response to intimidation and saying, I'm going to give you the real way to apply spiritual living and growth. And so in chapter one, he says, here's step one. Christ of God is all there is. Christ of God is all there is. In verse 15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Okay, so if you want God, and Christ is all you'll ever need, then that's all there is for it. There's nothing else you need to worry about it. Maybe more directly put, Paul would say it this way. You want God? Then you want Christ. It's that simple. It's really not any more difficult than that. That's the simplistic understanding of it. Anybody ever heard the phrase spinning image? Oh, he's the spitting image. Does anyone know where that comes from? He is the spirit and image. That's where that stems from. And Jesus is the spirit and image of God Almighty. It reminds me of the, of the 
police station, they put up a wanted poster all over town for a guy that had committed some burglary. And you know, those wanted posters, they had, it had the three photos on it, you know, the mug shots. It was the, it was the right side, the left side, and the straight on, right, in the center. And so they had that up all over town. And a couple weeks after it was up, the sergeant answered the phone one day, and a guy said, hey, those wanted posters that you had up all over town. The sergeant goes, yeah. He goes, he goes, well, I found them. He goes, oh, that's great. He goes, yep, I got all three of those guys, and I've got them locked up in my basement for you. And the only thing the sergeant could think to say was, well, okay, if you've seen one, no, you've seen them all. It's kind of like the Trinity. The Father and the Holy Spirit being beings that maybe we haven't necessarily physically seen. But Jesus, on the other hand, Jesus is the only one that ever presented himself. The Son, when sent to earth, Jesus came to earth in human form and was physically seen. And we've only seen Jesus. But that's the point. He's the image of them all. He's the spirit and the image of them all. Jesus was, in fact, the God creator of everything. Colossians 1, 16 and 17. For by him in all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created created through him and for him and he is before all things and in him all things hold together now there's some very specific things to pull out of this right here paul's making his point very directly the scripture is speaking very directly everything was created through and for him and then he goes on to say and he is before all things what would What would that mean? If he's before all things, now we're looking back at Genesis. This means means creation. This means Jesus was before all things. Christ is all of the creator God that you are ever going to want or need. And through his time then on earth, he's also the creator and head of the church, the body, the people, the all-encompassing people of God. Continuing in verse 18 through 20, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. Pay attention to that word. We're coming back to it. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things. Okay, come back. Supremacy. That's a powerhouse word. There is no level of authority greater than supreme. This is meaning that Christ is higher than anything or anyone else. Period. What do you do if an authority figure walks into the room? Let's say, you know, a a respected congressman, the president, maybe. Sorry. Some sort of leadership that is valued, when they walk in, what is, our, what is our response to their office and their authority? Most of the time, you stand. You stand in recognition of the office and authority that they hold. It is a respect of that authority. It's different with Christ. If Jesus Christ walked through those doors, what do you think we'd do? <laughs> Instantly, we would fall to our knees. How can we not? And that's the difference. It's because we recognize Christ as the supreme authority and ruler over all. There is nothing higher. Christ of God is all that there is. You want God? Then you want Christ. And then Paul goes on in chapter 2. And he says, Christ is all you need. He's all you're going to need. You shouldn't think about worrying about anything else because he's all you need and everything else is provided. In chapter 2, verse 7, he says, plant your roots in Christ and let him be the foundation for your life. All you need is Christ. You can be all you want to be. Not in the army, in Christ. Christ. And you do that through a full union with him. And here's our key verse. Chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. 
For in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Christ, who is the head over every ruler and authority, who is the head over every ruler and authority. Again, we've just defined supremacy. Christ has the fullness of God. You can have the fullness of Christ. So then that leads to a question. Okay, does that mean that I can be completely full of God then? The answer is yes and no, but mostly no. But let me explain. Picture this. When you're on the ocean or standing at the edge of the ocean and you look out, think about the fullness of that, how vast it is. When you look at it, it seems like there's no end. It just keeps going and going and going. That's Jesus. But the ocean is filled with water, right? So if Jesus is the ocean, the water that fills it, that's the fullness of God. And Jesus has within him the complete fullness of God. So what do we do? We come to Jesus, right? And we bring our cup and we say, fill us up. Fill us up, Lord, with you to have the fullness of you, Jesus. And so he fills up our cup and we allow him to fill us. So then we're full then and we are full of God in that because Jesus has filled our cup, but our cup has not contained the entire ocean, has it? So though we have a fullness in Christ and we are filled with God, we're not obviously filled with all the fullness of God in the way that Jesus is. But we are full of the... This is like a tongue twister. We are full of the same fullness. Have I lost anybody yet? Again, verse 9, in Christ lives all the fullness of God in human form. This is why God sent Christ, so that we could be filled. He wanted us to be filled, and we can be that way through Christ who has the fullness of God of God. You know, John actually addressed this in his gospel too. He said, for all, all his fullness we have received and grace upon grace. There's a power in the truth of a relationship with Jesus. And it's amazing when we can make that choice because then in that we are made complete because we've been made full. That's verse 10. You're made complete through what? We well, said, your union with Christ. Christ Jesus is all I need to be complete. It's not like the world looks at it. The world is in, in love with this idea differently. They, it's like, no, 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 no. Completeness comes from needing more. I need greater wealth. I need greater popularity, a higher title, a better job, a bigger house, fancier car, more social media followers. That is going to make me complete. I'm going to feel complete. And Paul's telling the church at Colossae, and he's conveying this to us, saying there's only one thing that's ever really going to truly complete you in your heart. It's Christ. You know, when Abby and I first got engaged and we were going to get married, before we got married, I actually had a sit-down conversation with her, and I said, listen, I love you, and I can't wait to marry you, and I want you, and I'm so thankful that God gave you to me, but I need you to know something. I don't need you. All I need is Jesus. Now, and a lot of people, when they heard about that, they went, whoops, you made a mistake. And let me tell you, she wasn't happy with me in that moment. What I'm very thankful for, though, is that a few years down the road, she had a revelation moment of truth with God, and she came to me and she goes, I understand what you mean now. I get it. You have to stop looking around and trying to find something around you that is going to fill you and, and make you complete. You've got to forget about anything else that you think is going to make you complete or lead you to this idea of spiritual perfection. Because if you do, what happens is, is the extent to which you need something else to fill you is the extent to which you find Christ deficient. Let me say that again. The extent to which you need something else to fill you, the extent to which you try to fill yourself and complete yourself with other things is the extent to which you say Christ is not enough. If that isn't convicting to your heart, 
your heart is made of stone. Because Christ is all you're ever going to need to be all that you can possibly be. And if you want to be all that you can be, then Christ is all you need. So then Paul begins to develop this by saying, here's how we get to this. You got to think Christ and you got to live Christ. You need and should want to become like Christ in every possible way that you can. That should be the ultimate desire of everyday living. And if nothing else, if nothing else becomes completely apparent this week for you, I want to challenge you in this. These next four verses, write them down or write the reference down and make it a point of memorizing these verses this week. Commit these verses to memory because they are unbelievably encouraging and they are what help you understand thinking and living Christ. It's Colossians 3, 1 through 4. Let's start with the first two verses. It says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is. Seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So first of all, you're in Christ, so seek Him. Meaning, think. Think Christ. Use the head. Set your minds. It's a transformation of thought. Remember, it's not just behavior. It's a transformation of thought. Paul said this in Romans, remember? You'll be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. And in Ephesians, he tells us that we're renewing our minds in connection with Jesus, and it puts us in conflict with the devil. And this is the place that Paul says our minds need to go and they need to be. And the reason that he reiterates this, there are several times where Paul goes, it doesn't pain me to tell you this again. He reiterates and instructs it this way because there are two points as to why. There's a twofold reason why you do this. And this is the second part of that memory verse, verses three and four. He says, my identity is there and my home is there. These are the twofold reasons. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. My identity. And when Christ, who is your life, who is your identity, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Ha ha, I'll be home. I'll be home. Each day, if we set our minds to be thinking on this and we set our minds to be on Christ, then that means that what we're doing is we are consciously, regularly, daily, continually in each moment, living in the presence of Christ, communication with Him, prayer to Him, engaging in His Word, finding joy in Him and loving Him, choosing in all things, no matter what we're battling with, laughing, crying, thinking, complaining, blessed times, struggle times, doesn't matter in everything we take the moment to be in the presence of God. That's truly striving to live within the presence of God. Not just in that quiet and alone time with Him, but amidst the busy, chaotic, overwhelmed daily life. Nothing, I think, nothing nothing captures this idea greater than the words of my favorite hymn of all time. Be thou my vision. It says, be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save that thou art. Thou my best thought by day or by night, waking or sleeping, thy presence, my light. Think Christ. Live Christ. Because Christ is all there is. It's all you'll ever need. And you have to think Christ, and thus you will live Christ. So Paul talks through the rest of this letter, telling him this is how you do it. In verse 12 of chapter 3, he says, Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Kind of some reiteration there, the fruit of the Spirit. If you're living Christ, you're living in the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit will manifest. There it is. We put that on because it's how we live as Christ. And in verse 13, he continues, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Guys, that's who Jesus is and who he was and why we choose to be that way. Paul also says, you got to clothe yourselves with the love which binds you together in perfect harmony. And whatever you do or say, you do as a representative of Jesus Christ. 
That is living Christ. But the cool thing is, is here, this isn't two separate commands or two separate ideas that Paul is presenting here. He, this is two in one. This is connected. That if you live Christ, you're going to think Christ. And if you think Christ, you're going to live Christ. They're connected. You become what you think about. And, you become, and what you become then is how you live. Billy Graham said, the way we live often speaks far louder than our words. Many times we act according to what we love. We act according to what we love, that which is most important to our heart and our mind. Simple example of this, how we take care of our kids, how we protect our children. Paul's trying to tell us if we think Christ, we will live Christ. And in that way, he will become the supreme authority over our heart. Because we will come to a point of realizing that in our heart and mind, that is what we truly love more than anything else. Jesus himself. Back in the day, and I say back in the day, because, and I say, maybe I should say back, 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 back in the day, Charles Spurgeon said this. In the days of Paul, the sum and substance of theology was Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed to call myself a Calvinist. I do not hesitate to take the name of Baptist. But if you ask what is my creed, I must answer, it is Jesus Christ. What Paul's letter to the Colossians and to us is saying is exactly that, but it's also saying that if, if Jesus is all you have, you have all that you need. You don't have to be intimidated. You don't need to try and find more. Corey Ten Boom may have hit the nail on the head for all of us when she said it this way. You may never know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Now I'm excited. We're going to sing Be Thou My Vision to close service today. I felt it appropriate. And I want you to consider deeply what you're truly asking and what you're truly saying when we sing these words. And if, if you don't necessarily sing along, then maybe instead to yourself repeat these words as the song is played and sung. Just simply say, Father, Lord, Jesus, all I need is you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, going to keep it simple today. Forgive us for putting other things ahead of you, for thinking that other things can complete us in the ways that only you can. May our hearts repent of that. And may we cry out, Father, all I need is you. We pray in your name. Amen.